Hi, I'm your host, Didi Chang. Audio Builders TV presents Audio Insiders. In this multi-part series, we have invited audio professionals to interview each other. In this episode, Sean McLaughlin and Derek Blackburn sit down to chat about building their studios with designer Lou Clark, and also the ins and outs of studio ownership. Sean started out in Los Angeles working under some notable producers like Andy Johns, Jimbo Barton, and Carmen Rizzo and has been fortunate enough to work with artists like Rush, Elliot Smith, and Marilyn Manson. Sean McLaughlin started his studio, 37 Foot Productions, in the Boston area as a means for musicians to achieve high-quality, label-ready recordings, routinely unavailable to unsigned artists. Derek Blackburn is a recording engineer and owner of Quiet House Recording in Bedford, Massachusetts. He has been in love with the art of recording for over 20 years and recently engineered and mixed records for Windmills, Husbands, and Idol Pilot. Audio Builders TV is produced by the students of Conquer Carlisle High School with help from Colonial Sound and CCTV. Please subscribe to us on YouTube and subscribe to our mailing list at audiobuildersworkshop.com. <laughs> Audio Builders. Audio Builders Workshop is a work group for the Boston chapter of the Audio Engineering Society. So uh, I know that you run 37 Foot Productions uh, on the South Shore. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about what's going on down there right now? Well, we're doing a big build uh, and we share, a, we share a designer. We do. Uh, Lou Clark from Sonic Space uh, has designed my space. This for me goes back to, well, I'll give a little backstory. Uh, the room that is that was next to my live room and control room, they're kind of conjoined in this kind of triangle configuration. Um, I was subletting out to some people who were shooting video and doing some voiceover work. Uh, and they ended up leaving. Uh, one moved away, one went on tour for six months. So they weren't around to actually use the space. So at that point, I figured I should probably actually do something with this rather than what I had done when I first rented it, which was make sure I didn't have noisy neighbors next door to me. <laughs> uh, yeah. So what I did was called Lou, had him come down for a consult, and uh, his first words were, this should be your control room. You know, it'll be a little narrower than your current space, but the way we can design it, the, uh, the footprint will actually feel like it's bigger and it's gonna be longer. So we've, it's, it's kind of configured in an L shape, with, well, it's a square, but it's got an L shape, and I'm sure there'll be pictures of this somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, with a storage space. So it kind of configures like that. And part of the design was to have some sliding diffuser walls come out so that it would, oh, that's would have great. a rectangular thing. There's an ISO booth in the back corner, um, and there's natural light around the corner of the L. So that's I'm, great. I'm actually able to keep natural light in a space. Yeah. It which comes in. It comes into the live room and your control room. Just the just the control. Just room. the control room. But just around the corner from the control room. So oh, that's you know, great. It's with the with the diffuser wall. It's not completely um, closed off. It's mm -hmm. there are gaps between it. So mm -hmm. so the diffuser wall. What type of diffusion did he put in there? Uh, it's just just all wood wood diffusion. You know, like one by fours. Uh, one by fours, two by fours, three by fours, all just kind of configured at different sizes. So the, they cut them up at different sizes and then they kind of put them down facing out on a board. Exactly. How many of those do you have? There are four. Four of them. And they're, they're I'm trying to remember how wide they are. They're probably each about three feet wide, but the, they're hooked up on a barn rail. So oh, that's great. The barn rails, you know, it just slides back and forth, but the way the wheels are configured on the barn rail, it allows for about a one foot gap between each yeah. of the walls. This is in the control room or the live room? In the control room. The control room, that's yeah. great. So you're gonna kind of tune the room, mm -hmm. essentially. And um, so what's on the other side of the uh, diffusers? Uh, it's just, just blank, blank wood. Just lots of just, space. Yeah, just, yeah. Or a space in between. Yeah, well there's there's space between them and then, oh you mean behind the diffusers yeah. in the space. Yeah. There There's an ISO booth back there. Okay. And there's an open space which I'm gonna treat as sort of a, an appendicized lounge to the control room. That's great. So it's, it'll be cool, you know, having, having natural light in a studio is kind of rare so I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> uh, That's true, I have no natural light in my place because it's in the basement. <laughs> yeah, my, my current space has none either. So, you know, my current space is 16 by 17 and it's really sort of 
uh, done guerrilla style. The whole thing was, you know, it's it's an elevated floor, but it's not totally floating. Mm -hmm. uh, same with the walls. The walls are, the walls aren't really floating, but they're separated from the outside wall. So I I do get a little bit of, uh, I do get a little bit of vibration if a large truck drives by or mm -hmm. anything like that. But there's nothing wrong with that. No, well it happens, you yeah. know, and then it becomes part of the charm of the record you're doing. Yeah. So in the states that you're in right now. Do people track like behind you, behind the control area? Uh, in the space I have now, I've got a 16 by 17 control room and then a live space that's 22 by 31. It's cut it's, off. Yeah, though. it's cut off. There's, okay. there's a wall between, um, you know, the, the, but the way the current space is, you know, like we were talking about having support beams. Right. You know, I've got two in my live space and one in my control room, and the one in my control room has a chair next to it, and you know, I've got other things so that it doesn't look like there's a big pole there. You sure. Know? And I've got like uh, guitar hangers hung on it and stuff, so it, it feels like part of the room. That's in the great. live space, that's where the mic, uh, the mic bays are mounted. Okay. So it becomes part of the functionality of the room. Uh, I, I don't love it, but you know, it eventually, you know, you, you just don't even really see it because that's where that's where all the mic configurations are and it allows for shorter mic runs. Yeah. Um, but the way um, on the other side of it, there's a big like four by 12 rack. So that's squeezing the 16 feet this way to about 10 and a half feet mm -hmm. because of all the space that's being taken up by those things and behind them. Mm -hmm. So the new space is gonna be about 11 feet wide. So when you said that you have uh, the bays, is that for your gear? Yeah. And in the new space, how much uh, space have you allotted for gear? I'm glad you asked because it's exciting and scary. Uh, <laughs> I have three 28 space bays and two 12 space racks on either side of the of the desk. Well, that's great. So uh, because of the configuration I talked about where there's a storage space, the gear is getting mounted right into the wall. Oh, that's perfect. And it turns into diffusers the way Lou's kind of angled them. So they have this angle that's matched on the other side by wood diffusers. That's That's awesome. It's, I mean... Lou has, Lou has been so easy to work with because he seems to be able to work within whatever existing space is there and make it feasible to get the thing that you want to get mm -hmm. and also affordable to get the thing you want to get. He seems to know the right materials to use that aren't going to bankrupt you. We also have a similar monitor, monitoring setup. Is that correct? Yeah. You have monitors on... On cinder blocks. On cinder yeah. blocks. Yeah, well, I will. What did he do for you and as part of that configuration? Um, well, the, the entire front of my room is just is just insulated to, to the nth degree. There's, you know, and it's not... Because the live room is on the other side of my control room, like, there's a window going right through to the Oh, there is room. a window. That's yeah. great. Um, I don't know how much of it's going to see because I'm really getting like about one third of the space in that window. So I'm still trying to figure out visually what I would need to do, if I would need to do anything to see what's going on in the far corners. Sure. Um, but because, you know, there could be a drum set right on the other side of that window. Yeah. Um, he just, he had the guys just shove 703 in the bottom and just you know, cheap old pink insulation all throughout the rest of it, just to basically give the sound, you know, something to hit before it came through the wall, you know? Yeah. And his, his theory was anything that we can do to, to subdue that, anything that that, that that sound wave is gonna hit that's gonna cause any kind of friction is a good thing. So he's just stuffed the entire thing around where the speakers are with insulation and then put the cinder blocks in and I've got I've got two speakers going in. I got a pair of ATC 25s and a pair of Pro X that are going to go right in those right in those spots. And it's really kind of making the most of the space. Yeah. I'm sure he did the same with yours. He, where... he did. He did. I I have uh, one pair of monitors, the uh, Neumann KH 120s that are on center box, uh, and I just I love not being able to see them and paying more attention to where elements sit in the mix and really just listening to anything is enjoyable in that room like mm -hmm. I brought my uh it wasn't my intention to do this but I brought my turntable and records down there and you know I found a way to patch it into my interface so I could listen to records down there um and it's really like having it be a place where I can 
do my critical listening has mm -hmm. been um, a benefit that I didn't even think about. I just thought about like, well, great, am I have a place to mix? Am I have a place to track stuff? Like, this is going to be great. But it's also become so much more than that. Um, yeah. And I'm really, I'm really happy about that aspect of it. So do you have a console in, that's going into this room or how is that set up? Do you have a desk or how is that? I have a glorified for? mouse. I've got a, okay. I've got a C24. Okay. So you um, have a uh, large control surface that mm -hmm. looks like a console, but it just controls um, Pro just, Tools. Yeah, exactly. And I tend to do a lot of like multi-channel automation. So it's good. It's good just for the workflow that I like to use. Um, and also, an HD? Yeah. Pro Tools HD. yeah, I've got an HD setup. I've got a, a Burl mothership, um, and I've got a whole lot of gear. Oh, so, that's great. Yeah, so I've got you know configurations that are going to work, and having the speakers set up the way I have, and um, having Rob Pemberton from Audiri Design. I don't know mm -hmm. if you know Rob. Yeah, I know Did that he... Lou's working with them now. Yeah, yeah, Lou, uh, yeah, Lou recommended him, and I knew Rob for I've known Rob for years through Parsons Audio, so. Rob came in to do the design and you know I told him you know I want to have I've got this little Tivoli mono, mono radio that I use just for reference in, in mono and to make sure the bass isn't getting out of control yeah and I've got this old Sony boombox that I use and I just kind of throw in a corner it's not the CLA boombox by any chance is it? I have no idea okay. I don't know what CLA there's uses one for a mythical boombox. Sony boombox from like the early 90s that's this is a, this is an early '90s boombox, oh, so it man. could be. We have to I mean, explore that. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's one of my first CD players. Okay. And it still has a cassette in it, you know, cassette uh, <laughs> control in That's it. That's awesome. But uh, I always like listening through it because I just throw it in a random corner. Sure. Because most people are listening to music that's playing in a random corner sure. of the house. Absolutely. So. Um, Rob designed this bump box, or didn't design it. You know, he just ordered a bump box for it so that we could have those two things hooked up to the hooked up to the monitor setup, so it's just easy dial through. That's I was great. actually gonna ask you about uh, your design because I was a little reticent about having the speakers uh, covered up when I first saw the design. Yes, yeah, so my only complaint is that if I ever have a band that takes pictures in my place or if I take pictures of a setup because I like to move things around a bit, mm -hmm. everybody always asks, where are your monitors at? Mentally, it makes sense to me. I don't really want to be thinking about the speakers. You know, I want to be thinking about the music coming out of the speakers. Yeah. The one bummer is I have really cool monitors, and I like people yeah. to go, oh, wow, he, he's got the good stuff. But yeah. it's not that big a deal. It's Lou's aesthetic, you know, and, it, and it's kind of been Lou's aesthetic for a lot of stuff, and it makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Um, My electrician did say he would wire LED lights in. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, in be, behind the... Uh, the fabric wall to shine directly down. Now, are yours panels? Can you take the panels off? Yeah, now? they are panels. Yeah, so I've thought about like maybe taking the panels off just for a shot, <laughs> just to get the shot of them in there. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I trusted Lou. The main reason I contacted Lou is because he designed Peerless Mastering, which is Peerless Mastering's A-Room, which is one of the, you know, one of the best sounding rooms I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. And I know he was part of a design team. That's why he doesn't list it on his, on his website. But he was, you know, he was pretty integral in that room. Um, yeah. And uh, just meeting him over the years through Parsons and through AES, uh, he just had this great, this great attitude about what he did and this great sense of understanding who his clients were in any situation and how he could make it work for them. Absolutely. So have you ever gone through this um uh, building out of a studio in your career before? Uh, not personally. Um, I started years ago in 1994. That's right, 1994, at uh, Prophet Sound, which was in Stoughton. Uh, they were building a B room, and so I was interning uh, while in my last year of college and putting in insulation. And that was, that was like my first day of putting in insulation. And they were like, you know, I was fascinated by the whole thing. And uh, they kept giving me engineering gigs after that because they're, they're like, if he's this excited about hanging up insulation, <laughs> he's going to love working. Uh, and, you know, through the years, they kind of grew and grew and, you know, got some pretty heavy-duty clients and, mm -hmm. and things. But that was the last time I was really involved in a build to that extent, them building an entirely new space. Mm -hmm. I had never 
done this myself. The place that I'm in was already built uh, by a couple of guys who used to work for Pro Audio Design because uh, they were in the same building as, as MySpace back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And that's how I ended up hearing about it was a couple of guys from, from Pro Audio um, said, hey, the space is going to be available. One of the guys was uh, moving on to another place and having a child so he couldn't run it anymore. Wow. You know, his wife said, no, no late night studios for you anymore. <laughs> we had a child. So I said, no way on God's green earth do I want to run a studio. Yeah. I don't want to do it. I never wanted to do it. I just wanted to engineer records and be a freelancer. Yeah. Uh, but I looked at the numbers. It's in a place that, you know, I'm in the South Shore. I'm not in the city. So the real estate prices are not even close to what they are in the city. Um, there was a parking lot. And it seemed like it was reasonable for me because I was in the middle of two full-length records and needed a space to record them. So I figured that this would be a good, at least, bridge to see if I could make it work. Yeah. Um, at the time, I had two partners. One of them got a gig uh, at Apple with iTunes and had to move to Austin within the first year. Uh, and the other one uh, just couldn't get any clients, so he stopped doing it. So mm -hmm. eventually my one third of rent became 100% of rent. And that was, that was pretty hardcore enough without having to do any kind of a build. This was the beginning of 37 foot? Yeah, this was okay. uh, like May of 2006. Okay. So it's been 11 years to the month. Okay. Right now. What is it like for you to be able to get up and just go a short, you know, period of time to work and back as opposed to like maybe building something in your house? Um, that's a good question. Well, first off, I live in a condo, so building something is oh, a little well, yeah. more difficult. Do you have even like a little area? Like oh yeah, where, we've got, okay. a, we've got, it's, it's a good sized condo and we've got an office space that my wife is now using because she works from home. Uh -huh. But it's still, you know, even with some of the exercise equipment in there, it's still a big enough room. <laughs> you know, it's the size of a, of a pretty big bedroom. Uh -huh. So, um, I could do stuff, I mean, and I have done stuff on my laptop. Yeah, um, but your place is so close. That's, that's the thing, is, is if I have to do anything, even if it's only a few hours, it's worth the drive down. Yeah. You know, just drive down, get the work done, and drive back. I actually did that last Friday. I drove, got there at 11, left there at 2. Uh-huh. Didn't hit traffic. Yeah. You know? If I just don't go downstairs. Like, if, yeah. you know, to have that separation... Mm -hmm. Like, it's just like, I'm just not going to go downstairs. That would cause... be the hard part for me because when I first moved here, before I had the studio, I was in a house and I had a 13 by 15 room that I turned into just a mix room mm -hmm. and, you know, very haphazardly, like, hung soundproofing all over the place. It was moving blankets. <laughs> moving blankets. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it was, I never left. Like, I'd wake up, I'd go in there, I'd look up, it was, I hadn't eaten in eight hours, and Ugh. you know, and I couldn't function like that anymore, because oh. I felt like, you know, it was diminishing returns that I wasn't even noticing, Yeah. and I like to think that, I, you know, I'm still improving, I'd, I hope that we're all still improving. Absolutely. You know? So, actually having a space to go to where I, where I can say, this is where work happens, and this is where home happens. I don't yeah. even have a good stereo system in my house. We've got like, like a Bluetooth speaker, <laughs> you know, and, and I feel like it's better for me to have that. Sure. Um, and oh, it, sure, it's also yeah. like a cliche, you know, it's like the total cliche of like the mix engineer with not, no good home setup, you know. Well, my turntable is downstairs. Yeah. The studio. <laughs> Let's talk for a second about taking care of yourself. I started getting getting tendonitis in both my elbows. Oh, yeah. And I'm pretty sure it was from carrying like 50 pounds of speakers to gigs sure um you know having a 50 pound speaker here and like a 40 pound amp in this hand oh, walking yeah. through wherever crappy place to get to your car where you, you parked a couple blocks away not not necessarily the best so i was feeling this pain here and and most likely the pain wasn't from that that just exacerbated the issue the mm -hmm. issue was probably the repetitive stress injury of a keyboard and a mouse being in front of me and not having proper arm support Right. Uh, so luckily, the keyboard player on the gig is a physical therapist. Wow. Uh, or I should say occupational <laughs> therapist. And he sure. was like, you know, 
let me come by the studio and let me just see how you're working. So he actually watched how he was working. He goes, okay, you're slouching a little too much and your, your uh, armrests are not high enough for your arms. Yeah. So he raised the armrests. He gave me some athletic tape, which allowed me to kind of like tape from the fingers all the way up, up across the elbow to give it a little extra support. And he said, uh -huh. you can just use the athletic tape. You can ice. So I started thinking a lot more consciously about that because you always think about your ears. You always think about protecting your ears. Right. But then you don't realize if your body can't walk to the place where you need to listen, then it's not going to help. Yeah. So yeah. I started looking at a lot more things. And I start also started looking at a lot of things that, that dealt with productivity in general. Um, so my initial thought was, you know, a psychiatrist takes a 10-minute break every hour after they're done with a patient to kind of clear their head and come back at things fresh. Why shouldn't we do that as engineers? It made a lot of sense to me. But then I started doing some more research on productivity in a creative workspace. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people kind of ascribe to this 90-20 rule where you work for 90 minutes and take a 20-minute break. Mm -hmm. So I've started to do that. And it's almost happening subconsciously now where like, I'll spend an hour and a half like getting a rhythm section to feel really tight in a mix and then stop and take a break. And it's usually like, you know, 90 minutes to two hours, something yep. like that. And then I'll step away, come back and listen. And then I might hear something that I hadn't heard before because I was too deep in the weeds right. to really see the, the full picture. Right. And I think that, I mean, when I'm working, I'm not listening almost as much as I'm listening. You know, I'm taking, oh, sure. I'm taking breaks all the time. I'm thinking about what moves need to happen or I'm just listening and not taking any action whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So it's probably, I spend an eight hour day working on a song and I'm probably actually working for about four hours mm -hmm. because I'm listening and processing and changing things and trying to come at it with a new approach. And then I still don't feel like I'm done. So I come back the next day and listen. And almost inevitably there's a change or two that I want to make because I was in it for eight hours. Yeah. Even if I wasn't fully like actively doing things for eight hours, I was in it. Yeah. So that's, that's something that I think's helped physically and with productivity because you know, you work for an hour and a half, two hours, get up and walk around. Uh, I don't know. Do you do attended mixing at all? I do like having the client there when it's finished. Yeah. If, if they're able to be there, like if they're out of state or whatever, it's kind of an impossibility. Yeah. Um, but you know, I'll use some kind of like a nice cast or something. Oh, like that I love to, nice cast. It's great, right? Well, yeah. I would imagine your Chicago clients would like that a lot too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but having something like that is a, is a big is a big thing. Um, but I don't like having clients there while I'm going through the process because I feel like they're hearing the decisions that I'm making. Right. So when it comes down to hearing it fresh, they're completely useless to it because they've thought along the same logic flow that I've thought as I'm doing the work. Yes. And I feel like that is taking them out of where they need to be, which is like hearing it fresh a few times and saying, oh, I didn't expect this, you know, in a good way. Yeah. And in this case, they expected all of it because they were there. But if I'm working all day and someone says, oh, I want to come in at like six or seven and just give a listen to the final and maybe throw out a few ideas, that's, that's great. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. But if they're sitting there the whole time I'm working, it's, oh, I can't do that either. Yeah, it's 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 pretty rough. And almost always I have like a final day where like if we finished a record and everyone wants to come in and just listen and throw a couple of tweaks at it, mm -hmm. let's do it. You know. But a lot of times I'm sending stuff out, and usually you know, I'm usually going through like two revisions before the client comes back. Sure. Um, you know, and I'll go through as many as they need. I'm currently working with a band that has eight members in it, so. Wow. The, the amount of notes that come back, you know, the, the, to digest. my, my point, my point <laughs> man on it is kind of saying, well, I have to get notes of eight people and then see which ones contradict this, themselves and then which ones are the same. And then we, I prioritize. And then I send you a list of like five, six, seven things, and then we fix them. So let's talk a little bit about education. There's a huge explosion of places on the internet that you can essentially learn how to engineer records from the ground up. Whether it's the right way or wrong way, you know, that's, it depends on the teacher. <laughs> but I mean, there's a lot of a lot of places to learn how to do what we do. It's a common analogy to compare audio engineers to chefs. 
-hmm. and you know and this is how I always describe it to people you know who say that they might want to record their record themselves or do part of the record themselves I'm, I'm like hey some people are really good at cooking at home and some people really like going out to a nice restaurant to a chef that they whose who's work they like yeah and it's the same thing with what we're doing um, that said it's the same thing with the education of it you know some people can learn by just being in a kitchen with a chef some people can learn by watching YouTube videos some people can learn just by trying and failing and trying again experimenting themselves it's it's all there and it's all available I think that it's all good to a certain point you can't really learn to do a record without doing a record you know that's and, right and that's with any education you know you can't you can't learn even you know going to Berkeley or U Lowell or any of these places you can't learn about doing a record until you're in a room with a band and and I would say that you can't learn until you're in a room with an artist and you colossally fail at something <laughs> I think you have to make mistakes to really understand you know some of the pitfalls that that can happen um, otherwise you're not really making a great record because you've never tried something so hard that you could fail at it. Yeah. You're just kind of tiptoeing through it. And I think I think all the online resources are great, you know, like the mix with the master stuff, the pyramid stuff, these podcasts that are that are happening that, you know, we we happen to be on right now. Mm -hmm. uh, all these things are educational and all these things are resources. So I think it's taking it for what it is and then applying it to something that fits within the workflow that you're doing or fits within whatever you're doing. It's never good to just like go out and, you know, completely lift something off of something that you've read yeah, or listened to. Absolutely. You know, uh, I have to say just because, uh, not just because I went through the mix with the masters, uh, program, but I have to say that their setup, I think, is the closest to master and apprentice type learning. Even if it's just a week, I mean, mm -hmm. they also have the online component, which is great. But it's the closest to the master and apprentice type learning that I think is really, um, you just, you need that component to be, reach a certain level of success. Mm -hmm. um, it's just never enough, like you said, to watch somebody do their thing and try to lift stuff off of that and make it your own mm -hmm. without putting in the 10,000 hours. I think a lot of this stuff is supplementary to the actual elbow grease that you have to put in to, to do the, you actually have to do the work to get better at it. You can watch videos all day, but if you haven't recorded anything yet, then the videos aren't gonna mean anything to you. So you know going to a mix with the masters I think you're right is as close to apprentice and mentor as, as you can get without actually apprenticing a mentor um, I was lucky enough to work with a guy named Jimbo Barton for years and he's still you know the best mixer I've ever seen he just he poured everything he had into what he was doing and I was with him for about a year and a half and I started off just assisting in the room with them and then became a Pro Tools operator and then kind of did some engineering with him when his engineer moved to Nashville and this was when I was in LA and we did some great records together and I learned just by sitting there and watching what he was doing and then like looking at a console when he finished a mix and going well why did you do that oh it sounded best and it, it's part of the reason why I think like working on a record or mixing a record isn't about like thinking about the frequency ranges that certain instruments need to sit in or thinking that I need to compress this a certain way. It's listening to what's happening in front of you and reacting to it. You know, creating something based on all the elements that are laid out in front of you. And that's kind of how he worked. It's one of the reasons why at times it was hard to pick things up from him because he would just say, well, it felt right to do that, so I did it. When I did it, it felt better, yeah. you know? But I did, I did learn a lot from him just by, just by seeing that. And, like, and I think that that kind of meant more. Well, it's not really about like 
you know, necessarily knowing this technique or that technique. It's about hearing things and how they work. Yeah, all that stuff is in the back of your mind, but you're not consciously thinking about like, oh, I need to dip, I need to dip it, dip right. 300 in this kick drum because it's it's just too boxy. Right. You know, you're just thinking, oh, this is making it sound better and just kind of reacting to it and making, yeah. it, making moves. You really have to know your tools in order to work yeah. fast. Well, to that's, work intuitively. That's the biggest part of it, though, is like transcending the gear. It isn't about the gear. It's about the song. And, and I think that's something that some of the online things lack a little bit, is that they're talking about this gear, or this plug-in, or whatever it is, when really, if you've got a great song there and you understand the gear that you have, you know, I'm sure you feel this way. I could probably do a mix with stock Avid plugins. Sure. You know, just because... They do the job, they function the way they need to function, and I can pull things up and just make the music sound good if the music already sounds good. Absolutely. The biggest advantage that like the best mixers in the world have is that they're working on the best tracks that have been recorded. Absolutely. That helps a lot. Yeah. I mean, since 2004, I was teaching at the New England Institute of Art, uh, and in 2015, I started teaching at Berkeley. And my, my biggest mentor as a teacher was was Al Shapiro, who is a teacher at the New England Institute of Art, who really kind of centered everything around the student. They just, he kind of was able to show them the tools that are in the toolbox and then have them go out there and make a completely disfigured house. Just make mistakes, just throw up more mics than you could ever possibly want. And then, you know, just listen to them back and see, see what sure. you like and what you don't like. And there wasn't really a wrong answer to it unless it was out of phase with something else that you were using. You know? Yeah. So, you know, do you like this better than that? Good. That's not a wrong answer. It's, you know, so he would, he would really dig deep into, into that side of things when he was teaching classes. And I try and between him and Neil deGrasse Tyson, <laughs> I try and get a lot of my techniques from, from people who are good presenters. Sure. You know, it's. I think it's really important to present material in a way that's going to be exciting for a student. And the best way to do that is to be excited about it yourself. So I do teach a lot of mixed classes, and I try and break things down into, you know, a, as simple as it gets. Level, EQ, panning, time-based effects. Everything else is kind of a subset of that. And then we, we try and paint this three-dimensional picture that changes over time. And how do we get things to be more exciting, and how do we... How do we focus on, you know, understanding the gear and understanding what the gear does, but then how do we, as we were saying, transcend that and try and just listen to the music and try and make the music sound as good as it can? Because these kids aren't going to leave school being Michael Brower or being Andrew Sheps. They're going to leave school being kids who've been mixing for maybe two years because they were focusing on playing their instrument first. Right. So the best thing that we can do is prepare them to go into a situation where they walk into a room and are the hardest working person that that engineer has ever had. And if they're like that and they're hungry to learn, then they're gonna excel in their career. So a lot of what I do is just based around the objective of the student. I'm trying to, I'm trying to not evaluate students on their artistic choices. And that's always a hard thing to do because if the song isn't working, then you listen to the song and you're trying to, you know, talk about things technically, but then the song isn't working. So you have to talk to them about why the song isn't working, you know, and that, and that becomes a bit of a tricky thing. This is something that I've been, that I've been uh, struggling with over the past like year or so where I've been trying to think about how to reevaluate this thing that we do when we, yeah. when we teach things because I think education gets so focused on the technical and loses a lot of the aesthetic and I think that's a hard thing to find a balance of oh yeah absolutely there's a manual for the console there's mm -hmm. not a manual for everything else for yeah. the you know thinking feeling perceiving let's talk about some fun stuff let's talk about some fun stuff what's um, fun well <laughs> Do you got any great stories? So I've got a really good story. So I was working with Jimbo Barton and Pat Thrasher uh, as the second Pro Tools op after Pat 
on the Russian Rio DVD in 2002. And it was kind of my job to go over the second set while Pat was working on the first set. At the time, Pat was a lot faster than I was. <laughs> he still might be. Um, I'd love to challenge him to a race now and see how I was because I was pretty slow back then. So I was working on the second set. Each set was an hour and a half. And just kind of going through and making sure that everything was on the up and up and, you know, kind of aligning things that needed to be aligned, you know, because it's a live show with... 72 tracks yeah so great show too it was yeah it was killer so the first uh song with the electric drum, drum kit there were two drum kits and it was on like one riser that revolved so <laughs> when the electric kit came up the first song was uh, a song called the trees and i get to it and i'm looking at the hi-hat and ride and it's a flat line there's like nothing on the hi-hat and ride and I, I panicked a little bit, but I went in and said, Jimbo, uh, there's no hi-hat or ride on the electric kit. And he goes, huh. What I, found, what I found out, or I should say what I knew beforehand, um, was that the sound truck back in 2002 wasn't like a sound truck that we think of now. It was an empty old bread truck. <laughs> and it had... You may or may not remember Tascam DA 88s. Oh yeah, absolutely. And so there were seven DA 88s that were linked, and that's what they were recording with in the back of this bread truck. Oh my god! And he's like, "Someone must have just tripped over a cable or something." <laughs> he said, "Well, let's call Neil." So he calls up Neil, who's who's Neil uh, Pert. Yeah, who's the drummer? Of the Rush. drummer. Yes. Yeah, sorry, everybody. It's okay. I'll um, fill in those blanks for you. And. Uh, you know, Neil's voicemail was, hi, this is Neil, I can't come to the phone right now, which normally it's, you know, people don't even speak on their own voicemail. Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, Jimbo leaves a message, tells him what's going on. Neil calls back and he says, call up Roland, send a runner over, get a brain in the two symbol modules, and I'll be down at about 7, 7.30. And he goes, well, what if Roland, you know, tells us to go take a hike? He goes, I'm the only endorser of V drums. They're going to give them to you. So they uh, they actually directed a runner to go to um, the guitar center on Sunset and went down, grabbed it, came back, set everything up. And Neil comes in. This was like my second time meeting him because he came in the first day we were working, just to hear Tom Sawyer. Uh, so he came in. He said, "Just." You know, if I could get a chair that's about like yay, about the same height that we're sitting on, just as a, a snare pad, you know, I'll sit on a stool and I'll just, you know, just have the video up. So he had the screen up and he's literally sitting, sitting like five feet from me. <laughs> and I watched him play the trees in one take with this little chair snare pad and these two cymbal modules and absolutely crushing it, like just <laughs> crushing it. Uh, so he does one take and Jimbo's like, no, we're good. And he goes, okay. And, you know, hung out for a bit and, uh, you know, was, I was, I had a book that I was reading when I would take breaks called the black elk speaks. And it was all about this, this, uh, uh, Indian shamans visions. And he was reading the back of it. He goes, you know, my teacher was telling me about this book. And, uh, Jimbo was like, you have a teacher? He goes, well, yeah, every great hitter in baseball has a batting coach, so <laughs> I have a teacher. And it was this guy whose name I always forget in Brooklyn uh, who, you know, played with, like, Buddy Rich and, and all those guys, and he did a Buddy Rich tribute record and talked to Steve Smith afterwards because Steve Smith, he was like, I noticed how much better Steve Smith got and how much better his technique got, and he said he was taking lessons with this guy. So he, he would... He's fly, fly to New York once a month and take lessons and would tell us all these stories. And... Another example of how important it is to have a mentor yeah. or somebody, somebody to guide you. Just someone to make sure you don't get in a bad habit. Yeah. And well, that's, that's really, that was really like his goal is to make sure that his technique was, yeah. was always staying where it needed to Consistency. stay. Consistency. Mm -hmm. That's really great. Well, this is why you have a sounding board, right? Like you, you have got engineers that you speak to every day and I've got, Absolutely. I've got like friends that I send mixes to, to to ask questions and just see you know just see how see how i'm you know balancing yeah. myself never mind the mix yeah i definitely depend on that group of there's only four of us and i depend on that group fairly heavily only needs to be a group of two 
Yeah. And that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's enough to get started, yeah. you know? Yeah. They're all much farther away. One's in yeah. Florida, one's in Seattle, and the other is in L.A. Okay. So. Like Four Corners. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. the Four Corners, It is guys. the Four Corners. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it's great to have stuff like that. And, you know, I've, I've got friends that I send stuff to just be like, hey, do you, do you think this bass is off? It's also good to have, a, if you work with a mastering engineer, to have a mastering engineer you can do that with. Yeah. You know, I, I use Jeff Lipton all the time, and if he's mastering something, I always send him something going, what do you think? Do you think I need to do anything different to this? And sometimes I'll just send a note going like, between like two and 300, if you dip the bass like 2 dB, it'll, it'll pull the vocal out a little mm. bit. And lo and behold, it'll be right, in, it'll be right at 250. Yeah. <laughs> and I pull That's it out great. 1 dB and it works. That's great. Yeah. I need a I need a mastering engineer. I need a relationship like that. It's really <laughs> it's really important. I mean, for me, I won't master anything I mix because mm -hmm. I always want a, another set of ears to come along sure. that is different than mine and is listening in a, with a and different mentality. It is not emotionally into, um, emotionally yeah. attached. Well, and and just having someone who's thinking about it with that goal in mind instead of the mix goal in mind. Because yeah. as soon as you start mastering your own stuff, now you're listening to your mix in a different way. Right. That might not be advantageous to you being in mixing later, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So I try to avoid it if at all possible. Yeah. I don't and I don't think I'm very good at mastering. So no. I don't think I currently I don't have a room. We'll see how the new room is. <laughs> uh, but you know, mastering guys that that's like a dark art. They make two or three small moves and all of a sudden the record sounds ten times better. It definitely <laughs> is a dark art. It's the darkest of art. In fact, you know, the um, person that I, the person's name that I heard the most as a child, that I was like, what does that guy do? His name is everywhere. I want to do what he's doing. Because um, I didn't mention this, but how I got into engineering first professionally was through mastering. Because I was really interested in cool. mastering and all. And, and, and this was like 2000 or 2001 or so. Mm -hmm. But the guy wh whose name I heard all the time was Howie Weinberg. And I used to listen to Casey Kasem's Top 40. And like at the end credits, they would always say like, you know, mastered by uh, Howie Weinberg. At the, I, like I used to listen to Loveline in the 90s. And it would be at the end, it was like <laughs> mastered by Howie Weinberg. And every single, it was like, if there were two guys that I wanted to meet, it was... Uh, Howie Weinberg, because he was everywhere, and the guy who's slip his name is slipping my mind. It's almost like forgetting Jesus' name right Bob now. Bob Ludwig? Bernie no. Grunman? No. <laughs> the guy who the guy who mixed uh Nine Snails, My Bloody Valentine. Why Alan I'm, Mulder? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Alan Mulder. Arctic Monkeys. Yeah. Yeah. So I wrote Alan Mulder a uh email once and sent it to his uh really his wonderful uh manager whose name also escapes me and i got a response back and uh that guy like again a name that i saw everywhere in that time period of when i was like really paying attention to music and uh or who was uh recording the music mm -hmm. that i was listening to uh butch vig alan Mulder, and flood this has been a great conversation. This has been fun. Thanks a lot.